So, during the first part of our journey, we had a temperature increase of two degrees. We are heading for six degrees. Now will be part two. Jem Bendel will join us in a minute. But before that, Ben, how's it gone on your farm like after these months of working? It's good, actually. Um, I was hoping to get a bit of it productive. And um, I've done a bit more than I thought I would. So. You're leaving the tomatoes behind, right? I think the tomatoes will be fine. I'm slightly worried about the runner beans, but uh, they'll be okay. Like, the tomatoes. How would you feel about being the last man on earth on your <laughs> farm? Um, <laughs> Uh, wow, uh, I don't think I, even I've ever gone quite that nihilistic. But um, I mean, I've always been okay with uh, isolation and my own company. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I don't know. There's, um, I do remember a quote from Michael Collins, the guy who was um, up on the, the lunar orbiter while, um, while the yes. eagle was down on the moon. Um, at the time that he was on the dark side of the moon... Um, he was the furthest away from any other human being than any other human being has ever been. Right. Um, the next two people were about three and a half thousand miles away, and then everyone else, a quarter of a million or so. Um, and someone said to him, what was it like being, um, you know, that the most all. isolated person that, uh, that has ever existed? And he just said, oh, it's quiet at last. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of get a bit of that. But... <laughs> Right, if everything breaks down and um, your brother and his 10 best friends <laughs> plus <Which brother>? their <laughs> respective <laughs> families would knock at your door, yeah. would you open up? Yeah, um, that's actually a much easier question to answer than would I like people to come before society breaks down. Um, I haven't quite made my mind up on that one. Uh, when it's gone, I'm sort of quite looking forward to um, helping out those that I want to, people that can find me. Um, What's the carrying capacity of your farm? Oh, I don't know, lots. Um, when I've got all the orchard done. Um, I mean, it's nice growing vegetables and fruits. Well, fruits are easy. Um, but growing trees is great because you just stick them in the ground and they get bigger and more productive every year. Um, so I'm certainly going for quite a, an arboreal-based future. So it, it'll, it'll feed a bunch. Thank you, Ben. So Thank you. Looking at societal breakdown and collapse, we're now visiting Professor Jem Bendel, who didn't fly in. Thanks for the carbon reduction. Professor Jem Bendel is a professor of sustainability leadership and founder of the Institute of Leadership and Sustainability at the University of Cumbria. He was very much involved in some very hopeful uh, initiatives with the World Wildlife um, Fund and uh, setting up the uh, Forest Stewardship Council, the FSC label that everyone knows, these little stickers and tags, uh, during these hopeful um, noughties, where we thought we could just change our consumption patterns a little bit and would um, help save the world. And um, Jem got a bit disillusioned, it occurs to me. And in 2018, last year, he um, published a white paper, not a scientific paper, but a, um, a thesis paper called um, Deep Adaptation, a Map for Navigating Climate Tragedy. So welcome, Professor Jem Bendel, and um, probably I'll leave away the academic title. Jem, you're an important input for um, Extinction Rebellion. There are some activists in the room. We are around 250 people looking at two screens. We all see you. Um, I hope we will hear you. People are waving their hands. We don't hear you yet. I'm talking to the technician. Hey, Jem. I haven't been speaking yet. Can you hear me now? Oh, wonderful. Loud and clear. Okay. There's Roy Scranton in the room on stage, waving hands author of um, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, and David Wallace Wells is in the room as well. And so, um, Jem, why did you get disillusioned? Is that really the right term? And what, what was the change you had in 2018? What happened to you? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for, thank you for having me in this digital way. I know it's not the same as being in, in the room, but... Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, joining what I can see is quite an unusual event. Um, the people you brought together and this, this depth of conversation you're going to have about 
about our predicament. Disillusioned. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I had been, every time I saw bad news on one of my devices, I had this uh, sense of panic, uh, particularly because I've studied climate science uh, back in the early 90s when I was at, at Cambridge University doing a ge geography degree. And some of the most sort of worst case uh, predictions uh, around permafrost melting and Arctic uh, disappearing, Greenland melting, or uh, forest fires uh, in northern latitudes. These things, I was seeing them, and, and so I was having that panic. And for years, that meant that I just thought I had to work harder, must try harder, must be more innovative, more bold, um, be smarter about how to persuade people to do the right things for the wrong reasons which is kind of a lot of what ethical consumerism or corporate responsibility uh, is about. So, but yeah, I reached a breaking point with that. I, I reached a breaking point in about 2016. I gave a talk at a climate conference in Australia. Uh, to, it's a 10th anniversary of a center I helped set up there. And I said, we st need to start talking about what if it's too late. Um, and then I mentioned deep adaptation as a framework and saying that I don't think we're having that conversation because we're too scared of it. We don't know how to have a conversation from a starting point of that it might be too late. And then since then, until this time last year, I sort of that was in the back of my mind and I was still processing it. And then I realized I, uh, yeah, my own truth is that it's too late to stop a catastrophic impact on our way of life from, you... from climate change. Did you, if I may ask, did you have some like personal crisis also because you had been, you had invested so much of your lifetime and energy in like like trying to soften or midi in, into mitigation, so more or less, right, or, or even reverting um, some stuff. So, was that like a, a personal breakdown as well? Like, did you suffer? Like, you know. Hmm. So, um, yes. Uh, the, and I think it's a similar thing for quite a few other people. They're going, they're going through right. this as well within right. the environmental field. Uh, that um, if you've really given your life to reforming capitalism to make it kinder and more sustainable, because you believed that that was the only pragmatic way of trying to have impact in the world. And if you've worked really hard and taken risks and have a little bit of a sense of sacrifice in terms of how much you've worked at it, then that's part of your identity right. uh, as your sense of self-worth. And so, yes, yeah, so that all had to collapse at the time that I was looking at these things. I had to allow that to disappear. And then that was scary because, well, who am I after all that? Yeah. You, you, you're the author of a paper that is um, said to have sent um, people to, um, to see their psy psychiatrist and deep adaptation, a map for um, navigating um, climate tragedy, right? So this is not about, um, about like mitigation. This is not about like avoiding, stopping, halting. Um, this is not about climate change. This is about navigating climate tragedy. What, what, what's the future you're um, depicting in this paper? What, what, what's the midterm future you're describing in that white paper? What's so, the world uh, you're seeing? Yeah, so you're quoting the Vice article, um, which came out, I think, in January or February. And... Uh, Yeah, it's an interesting one because it talks about how the reading that paper um, has has is is very troubling to some. In fact, to most people, unless they've already felt this and gone through this themselves before already. Uh, but for some, the despair it triggers is transformative uh, in terms of they then reassess their life and how they want to live. Right, and right. For some, it means they really commit to truth and love. Uh, right now. Uh, and for some, that means becoming involved in groups like Extinction Rebellion. And for others, it means 
uh, withdrawing from normal life and uh, prioritizing love and connection and being in nature and, and self-reliance. So there's all kinds of responses. But, um, but there, you were asking about what basically the, the, world the content would look like. of the paper, yeah? right. the main argument. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah. I can, I can quickly say that. Wonderful. So, um, so the paper's basically saying it's bad, and we don't need to look at what's in the paper I and mean, what's happening right now. So, you know, Greenland melting 70 years ahead of worst case predictions, permafrost melting in the same way, self-reinforcing feedbacks underway, so the Earth's heating itself, food impacts already worldwide leading to hunger, but also happening now in the West. Uh, and of course, the rise of the hard right as people don't believe in the future anymore and are getting a bit angry. So these, it's, it's a bad situation. Um, the paper also says it's over. So it's over for the story of changing things enough through markets or reforms. It's over for the story that we can stop climate change before it disrupts our way of life. Um, it's over uh, coming up with excuses for avoiding this conversation. And there's so many excuses around, we must have hope, we must do this, we must do that. Um, and it's also over for the story of control and dominion over nature. Um, it's also, I argue that it's, it's happening now. So, you know, the disruption in, in Syria, Mozambique, um, the disruption of way of life in Alaska and Greenland. Right now, Indonesia, 2,000 villages are needing fresh water shipped to them. Um, you know, it's, it's, we, we, we have the privilege of talking about it and just worrying about food prices going up a bit or you know, what might be around the corner, but I mean, it's here and it's now. In your um, paper, there's this, there's, this little, there's this little scene that you're describing, like you're, you're literally saying, um, you're at home, there will be no water coming out of the, the tub, you will um, uh, seek uh, your neighbors for help, and you might fear um, of getting killed. Like that's literally the, the horror scenario that I got from, from reading it. It's not all about this, but um, just to, to break it down in this like very near term sure. thing. And also you're talking about like the measures of how you want to deal with that situation. And part of it is like, for example, um, you know, leaving the coastal areas behind, um, debuilding uh, nuclear power stations, right? That's something mentioned on your blog, if I don't get it wrong. So that's the down to earth like actions. What is in there in the paper? Sure. Okay. So I am. Um, the bit that you've mentioned is because uh, academic writing is typically very dry, and it reflects um, an assumption in the academic field that uh, we respect somehow not being emotional. Um, there's this uh, illusion of objectivity, and so I was talking about the latest science, and then I, 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 I summarized it, and then I thought that, and I said what that may mean for right. for people reading this, which is likely to be middle class or people in the West reading this kind of paper, saying that this means that this is about our lives. And so I, I say, so I'm going to break with academic convention and address you as a reader about what this really means in a much less dry way. And then I said, right. this is what collapse would look like in, in your house wherever, or wherever you're reading this paper. Um, so that was why I, I did that. I mean, looking back, I feel that there's not there's quite a lot of fear in that paper and, and a bit of anger, um, perhaps not enough love. And, um, and so my, I didn't expect it to have the impact it's done, about half a million downloads now. Uh, and so my work since then has been about uh, helping people connect and discuss what does this mean and, and actually to promote um, sort of compassionate, curious and uh, supportive ways of, of, of responding. Before we dive into the response, um, mm. uh, just you're mentioning societal collapse. What is collapse? How fast will it be from your perspective? When will it happen? I had a conversation with your friend no. uh, Rupert Reed, who was talking about mass starvation in the developed world, uh, near-term mass starvation, and who had told me he had bought himself like a bulletproof vest. And so um, I, I was interested in your, um, your perspective of what is collapse. We're always talking about collapse. What is the collapse that, we'll, that you are looking at? 
Sure. So, yeah, in the paper I talk about societal collapse. And What's that? that is a, a very broad uh, category rather than, say, economic collapse. But it's um, the, the way I see this as, as happening is uh, in terms of within the West. Uh, in, in Britain, where I am, we import 60% of our food uh, and uh, grain production is very concentrated in a few uh, bread oh, baskets. Right. Mm -hmm. and so the idea is with the destabilizing of uh, Northern Hemisphere weather because of the, the strange behavior of the jet stream, um, you then risk uh, what's called in uh, food security world uh, multi-bread basket failure. And then also with impacts to other food sources and uh, being so reliant on, on imports, right. uh, you end up getting prices going through the roof if you're not having governments ready to intervene with rationing. Uh, uh, you can imagine what that would mean. That would mean no food going to dairy or meat production overnight in order to direct calories to humans instead. You can imagine the backlash. So unless you've got both government action and public will to respond to such scenarios, um, yeah, we're going to see um, civil unrest and then uh, political instability, perhaps therefore financial collapse. And I think we, even though we might still be able to feed ourselves, if we didn't uh, collapse our systems politically and financially, um, I think, I think uh, we probably will. We are, we are, our financial system is so fragile. We depend on confidence in global banks in order just to right. go and buy something from a corner shop. Um, so we we have very fragile systems. So for me, that's what will happen. I don't see it Venezuela. as being a Mad Max scenario. I see it more as uh, we'll have authoritarian governments when people get uh, panicked. Um, right. So um, and how should we? So what is there's for you, as I understand, navigating the climate tragedy? There's no way back, no way of stopping this, right? So how should we? Adapt. What What are the three core ideas in that paper? Sure. What is deep so in, Yeah. So in the paper, I am saying it's bad, it's over, and it's now, as I was saying. But it's also open um, because we don't know how bad. We don't know if we're going extinct as a species. We don't know if there's going to be mass population uh, death globally. Um, we don't know when things will begin to break down, and we don't know how much influence we will have on all those things. But we can certainly try to reduce suffering to increase our chances uh, and to somehow make the best out of this. And this sounds quite strange initially. You know, when you first hear this stuff, it's just a shock. And so the idea that we can somehow learn something from this and then we can find some peace, joy, beauty, meaning in it um, is quite strange. But for those people who then allow this traumatic information to sit with them and they manage to talk to people about it, you begin to find um, yes. a new basis for, for being and doing. And so the deep adaptation framework is simply four questions to guide that response. It's no, there's no simple answers about what to do. It's deliberately so. It's a, it's a framework for having conversations with people. And so there are four R's which summarize those questions. What are these four R's? Well, the first one is when we're presented by a situation like this is to ask what do we most value that we want to keep so that I call that I summarize that as resilience so a lot of resilience discussion tends to not actually ask the deeper questions it's just an assumption that we want to keep everything as it is well we can't so what do we most want to keep uh, secondly what do we what could we let go of because if we don't we make matters worse and I call that relinquishment and that's all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of ways of life and forms of travel, forms of entertainment, uh, saving for the future in the way that we do right now. Um, then restoration, the third one is, uh, what could we bring back? It's things that we've lost through modern society um, that could help us. So we, uh, we used to thrive in many ways and have a lot of fun and meaning before we all depended on fossil fuels. So what could we bring back? Um, eating with the seasons, for example, uh, more local production, uh, more fun, play, games with our neighbors, that sort of thing. And then the fourth R is reconciliation, which is uh, who, with whom or, or with what could we make peace with to reduce suffering, given the fact that we're not in control and we may now 
uh, die younger than we thought. So a lot of people, when they get a terminal diagnosis, there's that process of reconciliation with their regrets, with any disputes they've had, um, with uh, some of those that deeper stuff about the, the meaning of life in general and the meaning of their own lives. Huh. So David Wallace Wells, who um, was talking earlier, mentioned climate wars as one of his biggest concern. And so how does your peaceful, deep, adapted community react to the hungry Swedes who want to occupy Britain then because they have food scarcity and want to get the British wheat or whatever? Is there any, is there any, you know, is, there, is, is that just like a spiritual solution or is it like um, also a, is there a political pathway that you're seeing? So, um, when I issued the paper, right. I, it was, I, I thought I wasn't going to really stay involved in this conversation. I was being, feeling very much drawn to a spiritual path uh, and a lot of relinquishment. And yeah, but what happened was because it took off and I started to have a lot of conversations with people, a lot of people were, began to respond in the way you've just described, which is um, we need to protect ourselves from a world in collapse. And um, who's the we, who's ourselves. And I also met some people who'd been working on this for a while who said that they would do anything, anything to protect their granddaughter. And so you can imagine a world of psychotic grandparents justifying anything for their own grandkids. Oh yeah, very uh, much. Will absolutely um, not only reduce the chances of the human race uh, to, to mitigate, let alone adapt, Because if we're all fighting each other, we're not going to do anything about cutting carbon. But, but also, um, where's, where's the meaning, the joy, the beauty, the learning from that? Um, so I, that's why I set up the Deep Adaptation Forum to try and promote and, and embody uh, loving responses to our predicament. Wow, that's, uh, let me just quickly explain to the yeah. audience. So we still hear you loud and clear. The image is very good. Um, the light is good. Thank you so much. Um, The um, Deep Adaptation Forum is something that I found when I was like uh, researching Jam Bendel's current activities. It's a, a closed Facebook group of around 3,500 people when I was there-ish, right? Oh no, the forum, the forum is, uh, it has a number of platforms, uh, oh, but that's, okay. the, that's one of the things. But we, we have a professionals platform as well and we fund dialogues and do all kinds of things now. Um, right. There's like people um, who want to discuss climate change anxiety, right? Their fears, isn't it? Uh, no, it's a space for um, generative dialogue with the starting point that uh, people accept that collapse is likely inevitable or already unfolding. Uh, and so we have a deepadaptation.info is the professionals platform. So we have people working on government policy, research, coaching and counseling and psychotherapy, yes. So there's a professionals platform where people are trying to think, well, how does this relate to my job? Um, but then there's that Facebook group, which is uh, all kinds of people. I think it's about 6,000 people now. Wow. Uh, and they just, and there's a lot of grief sharing. And, and that's good because uh, public grieving is something we don't do in modern societies. And it's a complete natural response. So we shouldn't a, bottle it up and send people to therapy because they're traumatized and grieving about the state of the planet. So you, you're, you're participating and setting up events and conferences where, where people who are professionally um, working on, on how to deal with uh, grievance and climate anxiety, right? Like, I've been talking to Steffi Bednarek, a um, psychologist, I think, who works in treating people with climate anxiety. And then I would wonder, how does it look inside a group of 6,000 people who are super scared about societal collapse. How, okay, what do they so I wouldn't ask characterize you? them all as super scared. There's quite a lot of woke, spiritual, loving, engaged people uh, who are really um, helping each other and quite a lot of psychotherapists in the group as well. Um, well what, is, what does it look like? Yeah, so we, we, um, we're going to launch a database of uh, therapeutic practices and practitioners. Uh, and we're also going to launch a scheme to 
provide that for free for people who are choosing to to, to lead on this agenda, which is which you might call co- preparing for collapse, or, or or you might call it deep adaptation. Um, yeah. So uh, there's a it's a big challenge to the uh, coaching, counselling, and psychotherapy professions. Uh, you can't pathologize the shock, the panic, the grief, the trauma uh, on this. That's a normal response. And um, so yeah, I'll be talking about this at the UK counselling uh, conference in a couple of months. Wow. So last question to you. Um, a lot of like um, environmentalists are, are talking about we should push the panic button. I'm, I'm sort of um, scared, secretly scared or openly scared about whether this is a good idea to push the panic button. And so because you have these like direct experiences with people who are, you know, uh, grieving, what, 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 do you think we should push the panic button right now on climate change? Or Because you're not talking about mitigation anymore. You're talking about navigating it. And it's, it's irreversible and it's coming. Um, so isn't panic detrimental to you know, navigating the situation? Or is it good? Do we need to panic? Um, it's interesting. Who, who's the we there? So, um, uh, as activists, uh, or as neighbors, then uh, l- learn about what your truth is and then tell the truth. Um, I think it's a different question for um, if you if you're a politician or you're if, you know, then you you want to be able to work out what, what what's what's your more comprehensive message. Um, okay. At the moment, I'm not focusing on general public advocacy. I, I don't do mainstream media, and I'm uh, I yeah I'm focused more on trying to put in place the ideas, tools, and systems uh, in the professions. So that um, when this becomes much more, I mean, the the panic button will be pressed by people themselves. This is my view is that this is coming, and awareness of it will 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 be there because it's going to be our lived reality within a few years. So I'm more interested in uh, making sure that religions, schools, um, universities, uh, the psychotherapy profession, uh, civil servants, politicians, uh, the army, the police. Various, you know, I'm a bit more focused on helping them go through their all like emotional panic spin cycles, come out the other end with a, a groundedness, a calmness, a wanting to, to an okayness with the uncertainty of it all, but but whereby they they choose to to stay involved and try and reduce harm as much as we can. Could you give a big applause to Jam Bendel? Thank you so much for your help here. Thank you. And um, Jem, um, let us know if you will be joining for the discussion panel. David, um, Roy, and Benjamin uh, will be on the uh, final panel together with Jacket Davy of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Great. Okay. Uh, is that is that half an hour, one hour away? Like an hour away. Okay. Okay. I hope so. I'll I'll be back at my desk. Go right, okay. See you later. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. So. learning to die in the Anthropocene, that, that when I was doing research, that really stuck with me. Um, it's so dark. So after reading um, Jem Bendel's paper, I was already very depressed. I mean, there's a lot of people saying that the science he's quoting from is not the, the most you know, solid, and sometimes he's referring to like blogs, scientific blogs. But um, more or less, I think, um, Roy, you would share his perspective on um, the inevitability of a coming societal collapse? Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think I basically um, agree with that, that assessment. Um, looking at uh, what's, what's happening right now with uh, uh, climate change, ecological collapse, um, and the, the massive transformations that would be required to 
do anything substantive about it, right? Um, according to groups like the IPCC or the IPBES, mm -hmm. um, you're talking, they're talking about total social and political revolution, right? In order to, to be able to address uh, the problems that we've started. Uh, that, that doesn't seem very likely. Right. And so, so the most likely future, it seems, uh, at this point is uh, the, the slow unfolding um, collapse of global capitalist civilization. So you have a bit of a special history because you, mm -hmm. you have this um, past as a um, soldier being deployed in, in the Iraq war. And, but that is actually foundational for uh, your book, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. And um, you are now teaching as a, a university professor um, at Notre Dame um, for English. You study philosophy. So what, what's the story behind this book? How, how do you come from being a soldier in Iraq to writing a book about learning to die in the climate so societal collapse. <laughs> right. Uh, so it's somewhat of a long story, but I'll try to keep it brief. Um, and it's, I don't know how much of it would be of interest, but uh, I'm a working class, I come from a working class background, um, was a college dropout, uh, spent several years doing various jobs, uh, and, then, and then joined the army in 2002, partly uh, with the idea of going back uh, to college as a way to fund my college education. Um, and I, I'd been an environmentalist too in my youth um, and been somewhat concerned with climate change, although it seemed quite distant at that point, global warming. Um, after the army, went back to school, got a bachelor's degree and then a master's at the new school, studied philosophy, uh, got a PhD, was getting a, was earning a PhD in English at Princeton with the idea that I would teach and study poetry. Um, and it was a few years ago, toward the end of my uh, study there, working on my dissertation, I was able to attend a seminar on the Anthropocene and post-colonial thought. Uh, and I, I wasn't really sure what the Anthropocene meant. I was curious. It, it seemed like a term that was floating around. Uh, and it seemed like it might help me think about my work about my work on World War II and American literature. Um, so I signed up, and uh, in doing the background reading for that that seminar, I read up on the recent IPCC reports and World Bank reports, um, and read David Archer's book, The Long Thaw. Um, and over the course of that summer, um, doing uh, all this reading, uh, uh, getting up on the science, um, coming to terms with with what these very conservative, uh, respectable bodies were saying, um, I, I realized that that we're we're fucked. There was it's just like these the, the the World Bank is saying that unless we have a global political social energy revolution, right, that we face catastrophic effects that threaten civilization as we know it. And, and, so, and, and so I'm like, wow, that, this is the conservative, these are the conservative voices. I mean small c conservative, not. Um, and, uh, and so that, that led me to try to, well, what does this mean for life? Here I thought I was just gonna be a poetry, an English professor and read poetry. Uh, I did all this work, I went, joined the army, went to Iraq so that I could have this, this uh, Cushy, cushy bourgeois life, um, and now the world's ending. Right? And how do I, how do I, what do I do? How do I think about that? And so then I wrote a, a short piece called "Learning How to Die in the Anthropocene" uh, for the New York Times, um, and it was just me trying to begin to think through the philosophical issues around climate change, uh, the the existential issues that climate change poses, some of the things that. Um, you know, all the other, Jem and David and, and Ben have, have discussed today. Um, and so I wrote this little piece. I thought it would go up and then disappear, um, but it felt like something I had to do. Um, that piece um, went as, you know, as Jem and, and David have experienced, sometimes these things go out 
and it really taps into. It, it went totally viral. It went totally and, viral, and, and and from there, then I began to do more work and, this, and wrote the book. There's this situation in the book and in the essay where you say you've seen the collapse or a collapsing civilization firsthand. Mm -hmm. I think not many people here in the room have made that experience, and so. I, What, what did you see there? What was your experience that you saw in Iraq that you kind of like saw again some years later at home? What did you see in Iraq back then? What, what was your Iraq experience of a collapsing, what does a collapsing civilization look yeah. like? So I deployed to Iraq in, in um, May of 2003 after the war was officially, the official war was over um, and we were supposed to be involved in stability and support operations. Um, And I spent uh, about 14 months in Baghdad uh, doing, doing various things, uh, patrols and convoys and uh, dealing with unexploded ordnance. What I saw over the period there was uh, what happens when you, when you shock uh, a, a modern city, when you shock a modern nation. Uh, Iraq, Uh, had been at one point one of the most um, modernized, developed uh, countries in the Middle East, but but repeated stressors, uh, and then finally the the American invasion in 2003, um, just just broke it all apart. Uh, you know, literally, you see, you, you saw the infrastructure break down, um, water, what, what, electricity, mm -hmm. um, civil governance. Police and what happens was images that come to mind here, like an example that's that you can't forget or something. Um, I mean, there's, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, puddles of sewage in the street. Um, you know, uh, uh, a dead body that would be on the street for days. Um, the, I don't know if there's particular images that can communicate the situation. Um, Because what it was 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 a kind of an environment, right? It was uh -huh. a uh, condition, a, a living con condition, a right? living condition. But the thing is, is that humans humans don't, you know, when when anarchy emerges, right? We find new ways to organize ourselves uh, in order to order our existence in that in that particular environment. So what the US had created with the invasion of Baghdad was a situation of a, a pretty pretty much pervasive anarchy, except for those areas that the, that the US military specifically controlled. And it, it gutted Iraqi civil society, it, it gutted the Iraqi army, it dismantled all this infrastructure. And so then out of that emerged the Sunni Shia sectarian war that so wound up killing thousands and thousands of people over the next few years while the US Army sort of stood back and watched or sometimes helped. But what emerged was a sectarian civil war out of this bad condition, out of this, what had been a civil society that we destroyed, right? right? And, that's, and so that's where this learning to die in the Anthropocene begins is asking the question of, What happens when we see repeated shocks to the system, right? When you see, you know, multiple, multiple storms and ecological disasters and agricultural disasters, right? Hit a place like New Orleans or Puerto Rico or New York or that's, that's Hamburg. So, that's such a strong part of your essay. So you're telling this story of how you were um, how you were in Iraq and you were actually scared to death oftentimes when you were like walking these very unsafe and, 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 and stressful territories um, armed and probably in your tanks and would f fear for your life somehow and would have to deal with this and then you're coming back to the United States in a way and at one certain moment you're You're seeing these images. I think it was Hurricane, uh, Hurricane Katrina, right? That's right. You mentioned. Yeah. And you are somehow seeing the same situation again. Yeah. And that was like a moment where you kind of like, what happened in that moment? What was your, is that like a moment where you realized it's happening here? Uh, the unit I was uh, stationed with in Oklahoma was put on alert to deploy to 
to New Orleans and we did all kinds of riot control training. Oh. Uh, we practiced with, with shields and like half of us would be the, the riot and half of us would be the, the troops and then we would try to smash through the shields. Um, and and uh, we had pallets loaded, ready to go. Uh, and thankfully, we didn't eventually deploy. Um, but it was a very, uh, it was an intense moment of seeing um, the same kind of infrastructure and social breakdown that I'd seen in um, in Baghdad happening in in an American city, not not far from where I was. Wow. Um, you know. The, what happened in Katrina was, uh, you know, the, the government established after, um, after too long a time, established some kind of control over the area and, um, you know, the city has, has recovered to some extent. Uh, um, but the, the issue is, you know, what happens, who steps in in a moment of catastrophe? Right, and, and who are the actors that we depend on right, to, to maintain or reestablish um, the rules of society in these moments of crisis? The, what I found so fascinating about your book is that as opposed to Jem Bendel, who's thinking about this like societal approach of adaptation mm -hmm. and preparing you know, the military is one part, but also preparing the people for, for grieving and relinquishment and whatever he calls it. Yours is very much about a very personal philosophy of how to, how to or an, I don't even know if you can call it your, <laughs> you study philosophy in Princeton, right? Um, so can, I, I dare calling it a philosophy, I might be wrong. Uh, an approach of how to, to personally navigate through uncertain, territories and futures. Could you describe that philosophy and how, how it came about? So the, the idea is, is learning, learning to die. The, the idea behind learning to die in the, in the Anthropocene um, in one sense came to me from my experience as a soldier in Iraq where I faced um, you know, I, I was terrified going out on these, it was particularly during these missions when we would, um, we would drive out into the city and find munitions, uh, unexploded ordnance, um, these munitions caches, and then we would load them onto trucks uh, and then drive them across the city hoping that nobody shot at us or blew us up along the way and then download them somewhere else. And all the, all the time, um, you know, these, some of these munitions were particularly, um, um, precarious, uh, like the white phosphorus would sometimes just go off. Um, and so I, there were IEDs going off all the time. Um, I found myself terrified and the, the, the amount of fear was beginning to affect my ability to do my job. I was a Humvee driver. I usually drove the lead Humvee in the convoy and, uh, you would I, have been the first. Yeah, uh, and it, it was because I drove the commander, um, and it was like it was making it hard for me to keep doing my job, and and I had to come to terms with my role and the situation. And part of the way I did that was by turning to this samurai manual by the um, uh, called the Hagakure, um, and. Uh, it's basically a, a Zen philosophy for samurai warriors. How did, how did you find it? Um, to be honest, I, I, I'd come across it somewhere, but the, um, the I guess, most uh, salient ex uh, expression of it is in the Jim Jarmusch film, Ghost Dog. You know the director, Jim Jarmusch? Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he made a movie called Ghost Dog uh, uh, with Forrest Whitaker and the, the Riz is in it. And anyway, it's the Hagakuri features heavily in that. But the point is, is that it's essentially a kind of Zen take on mortality. Um, what the Hagakuri advises is that you um, imagine yourself as dead. You meditate upon your death, you, you think about it, you take time each day to picture, imagine, internalize all the different ways you could die and accept the fact that you are dead, already dead. 
so that you can then move through your life without fear. Um, or without being being hamstrung by the fear that you will die, right? You go through the day, you do your job as if you had a, you already know that you're going to die. And this meshes, uh, for me, this meshed very deeply with um, a long tradition in Western and Eastern philosophical thought, right? Going back to Plato, arguing that philosophy itself, the process of philosophy itself, is in some sense learning how to die, learning to confront the fact of our mortality and our transience in this world, learning how to understand that all of our projects, all of our entanglements, all of our commitments, all of our loves, all this is passes. And, and then what, right? How do, we, how do we make this life meaningful knowing that it ends? Um, Oh, yeah, that used to be quite easy. Um, religion was there. Well, sure. Uh, <laughs> um, and people have all kinds of ways of, of shortcutting, finding a shortcut right. answer to the question. But if you really start, start thinking about it, um, we have to address bigger questions of human continuity and what more existential questions of, of what, is the, what is the good, what are the values that we live by. Um, and it was thinking back, confronting this whole idea of, of you know, what the World Bank was telling, the IPCC reports and the World Bank reports and t saying that, you know, we, we face the distinct possibility of civilizational collapse from climate change um, and ecological collapse. Um, trying to, to make sense of that, I then went back to this experience in Baghdad, right? and went back to this strain of philosophy and thought about, tried to think about that, what that would mean on a, on a civilizational level. What does it mean to scale that question up, right? Um, what does so, it mean to accept the fact that this civilization, as, as embedded as we are in it, as committed as we are to it, will end? So, so it's sort of like, as opposed to Ben, who's going to his like farmland, you're sort of like a mental prepper then. You're doing all the stuff, you're like, it's already over. Uh, I can fly from LA to, to Hamburg to this fancy conference. I can smoke cigarettes. Um, it's great. Um, I'm already dead. It doesn't matter anymore. But then again, is, are, you, are you sort of like a you know, like you know, mental prepper? Is that? That right. might be one way to think about it. Um, and I've, you know, I've certainly been accused of, of, of nihilism, but I don't think that's the right, the, I don't think nihilism is the right, is it right. Um, so yeah, you, can, you could think of me, or you could call what I'm doing a kind of mental prepping or mental survivalism. But the, the point of it, right, is not a kind of um, nihilism or fatalism. It's not, oh, I'm going to die, so nothing matters. That's not the point at all. The point is that this civilization is, is over. How do we adapt? How do we, what can we do then to maintain a belief in the possibility? What can we do to maintain the possibility, the mere possibility of a human future in this new catastrophic world that we've created, right? Uh, you know, the things that, that Jem was talking about with his, his four R's, right? What can we relinquish? What do we want to, what do we want to remain resilient, right? But, and to really, to really put oneself in that open space of new thought, but isn't, right? We have to let go of our commitments to civilization as it exists. Uh, um, it's so exciting, I'm getting nervous, sorry for constantly interrupting <laughs> you. Um, so, because the point is, it sort of helps yourself, probably. Yeah. And I, I guess it's like, you know, it's like a, a nice gesture of you to release the ideas that have helped yourself, probably. Mm -hmm. But um, David Wallace-Wells pointed out that there's such a great difference between four degrees and three degrees. Mm -hmm. So, to be like, um, you know, it's either we've, we've mastered the climate change thing or it's all gone and I will prepare for a total societal collapse. And, you know, is there, a, is there still something about mitigation that you're considering? 
Is so, there any worth in trying to kind of like reduce the harms? I guess, uh, so a couple things on that. The first thing I would say is that there, there are definitely, you know, differential degrees of <laughs> suffering um, that lie before us. However, the, the global climate system is not a thermostat. Right, we can't just turn it up to two and then say we're done. That's that's all we're gonna do. Right, all the feedback mechanisms that we've, the dynamics that we've heard about from methane and permafrost and and so on, the the global climate system is a is an enormously complex, uh, interdependent um, system, and we've we've put so much carbon into the atmosphere and we've we've so whacked it out of alignment that the idea that we could just simply stop doing what we're doing and then everything would be okay seems somewhat absurd to me. Um, so, you know, there are, you know, there are a range of, of mitigation solutions that people put on the table that, um, you know, all of those frankly would require enormous global political efforts. Um, and then none of that seems especially likely. The other thing I would say, so, is that, is, it sort of relates to that, which is that the way that we live now in this global carbon-fueled capitalist system, right, the, the way that we eat, the way that we travel, the way that we organize ourselves into cities and societies is completely unsustainable, right? It is going away. It, the two possible, the two, the binary possibilities are either it collapses and uh, degrades and, and right. eventually disappears, okay. or there's some kind of global revolution in energy infrastructure and uh, political and social systems that allows us to transform society enough that we can, we can begin to mitigate and slow down climate change as we know it. I, even the best case scenario involves a complete transformation of our way of life. I understand. Right? So even the best case scenario, in order to get there, still requires us to make this enormous uh, leap in the dark. Right. So, very last question as we're running out of time here, and James is about to start. What do you think will come out of pushing the panic button? Because you've seen these environments, you've seen people under these severe conditions, as a soldier, as a philosopher, what, what will come out of pushing the, it's five after 12, bam. This is why, so my fears of what might occur if we, if we push the panic button is why um, I developed the, the idea of learning, learning to die, right? Of, of learning to accept, find ways to accept the situation and come to terms with it and come to terms with our mortality. Because I think if you push the panic button, what will happen? you are going to activate fear. Uh, and when you activate people's fear and their mortal fear for themselves, for their grandchildren, um, for, their, you know, for their friends and their families, uh, I think what we're likely to see is what we're exactly seeing now a rise in nationalism, a uh, rise in sectarianism, closing down borders, uh, increased conflict, um, and uh, um, an, an increasingly um, desperate, uh, selfish, um, uh, and, and grim sort of calculation toward what we, any particular we, needs to do in order to protect themselves in um, a catastrophic future. Thank you. So, lights down, please. In the next panel, we're going to explore these fears, and we're going to look if there's proof for that. But now there's James Ferraro. Thank you so much, Roy. Thank you so much, Benjamin and Chen.